नीलम प्लीज लेट मी नो ये गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन वेलकम टू लॉ सीखोज वेबिनार ऑन जेंडर रिलेशन सेक्शुअल हेरासमेंट एंड लॉ टूडे विल बी अंडरस्टैंडिंग फ्रॉम परस्पेक्टिव ऑफ सोशियोलॉजिकल एंड एंथ्रोपोलॉजिकल परस्पेक्टिव टूडे आई एम वेरी प्लीज टू बी होस्टिंग सुनीता रेड्डी मैम शी इज एन एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर at jnu and she is also a founder chair anthropos india foundation and she is also an honorary president at satat a community based organization this is a very important aspect of law uh, we really need to understand law from an anthropological perspective uh, ma'am will be sharing more light on it so i won't take much of your time so over to you ma'am okay. um good morning can you hear me you're audible now yes thank you so much uh, and thanks for introducing me i would like to thank uh, law seco group which is doing a commendable job by inviting people from different spheres to interact with all the lawyers and young students to understand issues which are related to law however uh, sociology and anthropological understanding is very important i'm sure some of you or all of you have courses uh, in your law course related to sociology or related to anthropology because uh, the legal aspects have to go hand in hand with social structures and social problems and understanding the nuances of social relationships and that's where i thought today i would like to talk about uh, this particular issue which is so important uh, related to gender relations sexual harassment and law from sociological and anthropological perspective uh, at the outset i would like to state that i'm not a gender specialist but based on my own research uh, uh, sociological and anthropological research and also uh, looking around being an anthropologist observing a lot of issues around uh i thought of you know uh, sharing some of my thoughts and also uh, from the studies which have been conducted uh, on this particular area um since i'm trained in anthropology and i have been teaching public health uh, sexual assault sexual violence all these are also public health issues and that's where uh, our uh, recent work related to child abuse is one of the important uh, areas which i am also very deeply concerned um before i go into uh, some uh, common understanding of few concepts like sex gender masculinity femininity i would like to uh, just narrate a small uh, newspaper clipping which was uh, recently there in the newspaper about uh, various cases i mean it's not uh, a one of the cases and every day you pick up a newspaper you will come across some or the other sexual assault on women and even on children according to ncrp data a woman is raped every 16 minutes in india but all too often the scripts that follow sexual assault seem to depend on the identity of the victim and assaulter their social and political affiliations while we therefore see lawlessness and impunity play out in many of these crimes rape and its aftermath also have much to do with the pervasive patriarchal order where women are male property and men are either protectors or predators because rape is seen as a crime against chastity and family honor the response is to further cramp the lives of women shut them in for their own safety the specter of sexual assault looms over all girls blocking their mobility their freedom and ill chances rape must be understood as a crime against a woman's autonomy her rights over herself if she can't go to school or work safely it deters her from both the paths and many social issues and social uh, action
I I think there is some network issue. So uh, I I hope the network would be better soon. So please please be connected. Of sex and gender, as all of you know. Sex- Ma'am. Yes. We we uh lost you for for a minute. So if you can please uh come back yes. from there. Just a minute. Uh, we lost you for like thirty seconds or so. Yeah. Uh. So uh, let me first start with some basic concepts uh, of like sex and gender. As many of you know, sex is a perceived biological differences. Now we have moved from binary male and female classification. to in between and intersexes or transgenders the category introduced as other or third sex so uh, sex is a very biological uh, category whereas gender is the social and cultural constructions observed performed and understood in any given society often based on those perceived biological differences so gender is not determined biologically as a result of sexual characteristics of either woman or men but are constructed socially now uh, how gender plays in everyday life there are very many gender stereotypes gender stereotyping refers to the practice of ascribing to an individual woman or a man specific attributes characteristics or roles usual day to day conversations like don't cry like girl boys will be boys boys should play with machines guns and hard toys and girls with soft toys girls should not argue certain jobs are meant for boys only and others for girls cooking cleaning care giving child care as women's work so these are very many gender stereotypes which you come across every day and society family also uh, and especially uh, peer also socialized children to fall under these stereotypes if they behave otherwise they are named as suppose if, if you look at your books uh, in your historical book khub ladi mardani wo to jhansi wali rani thi the point where mardani means she fought like a male it also shows the stereotype as women are not meant to fight and if they fight they are fighting like men and very often you Uh, hear from mothers or even many people saying that don't cry like a girl if a boy is crying uh, and men should not be expressing emotions so these are some of the stereotypes which are very well ingrained in the society and they are passed on from generation to generations unless one is sensitive about these issues then again when you look at there are certain attributes which are given as feminine and some as masculine now the terms masculine and feminine refers to traits or characteristics typically associated being male or female when you say masculine feminine there are major characteristics like feminine means women should be soft spoken well dressed shy coy demure sacrificial non argumentative emotional sensitive so all the softer aspects are related to feminine whereas masculine it is seen as strong bold rash go getter emotionally strong macho so many of these characteristics are thrust upon uh, male and female depending on the stereotypes but it in reality it's not so even men can feel emotionally connected they can be soft at the same time they can be emotional and they can even cry but they are discouraged to say that this is these are not the masculine traits and that's how they have to uh shut their emotions or do not display their emotions in public it's very interesting to know that in some cultures like in up uh the uh the masculinity is measured by uh the amount of rabadi which is the mix like uh, 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 it's like a milk which is you know uh, made into rabadi the more a man can drink rabadi the more he is masculine and it's very difficult to understand how the uh, the good digestive system can be seen as masculine compared to you know any other aspect and these are some of the traits which one can understand how masculine uh, are measured in the society if the girl dresses like a boy then she is seen as a tomboy and if actions and perceptions of being feminine 
and masculine are not falling in line to what I said just before are then gender um, stereotype breaking. And this is now, of course, uh, many uh, discourses are talking about and the sensitivity is coming. And um, also one can see a little change which is happening. Um, however, um, our, one of our study uh, in Delhi, we were looking at uh, gender-based violence in urban spaces, and we were talking to uh, women uh, and young girls in colleges. A uh, lot of women, uh, especially in, even in the middle age teachers, uh, expressed their fear to go out in uh, Delhi uh, after, say, midnight. And their perception because of the being a rape capital uh, after uh, Nirbhaya's incident, that uh, they expressed their fear and anxiety. And one of the teachers said, and the sense that she, uh, she in a way uh, shrinks because of the fear when she goes out late in the night. And uh, studies have also shown that uh, the bystanders, they don't play any role and they are just mute spectators rather than intervening if there is any assault happening. Now, uh, another uh, incident which we came across when we were doing this study uh, in a college where one of the girl respondent wanted to speak to us separately. And then she came up to tell us that when she and her boyfriend uh, were uh, there in the college premises after college hours, one of the guard came to them and then uh, he asked uh, the girl's boyfriend, can I also get a girl like this girl as a girlfriend? And uh, it was very shocking for her and maybe he said few more things which she did not uh, share with us and she was quite disturbed. This actually leads to a point as to how do you see men who are in the city, especially cities like Delhi or any other metropolitan city where, where there's a lot of migration and people coming to the cities, uh, leaving their families behind. And if they are staying alone in the cities and working hard and not able to uh, relieve their, uh, say, uh, any urges, sexual urges, because they don't, their families are not with them, and they see uh, young men and women roaming around and uh, possibly the, the way the assaults can happen. But at the same time, this doesn't mean that the, it's the migrant workers who are the sexual offenders. But when you look at many cases where even the high profiled um, men who are in very good positions are also booked for sexual assault. So the point is, there's not much of studies which have been done to understand what make men uh, of, um, become sexual offenders. What is it that triggers them to you know, uh, sexually assault or rape a girl or a woman? Uh, and these are some of the questions which we need to still understand. And um, we have been trying our best to reach out to the police and even BPRND to know that it is more important for us to understand the psyche of the uh, uh, sexual offenders, or if I say predators, which is a strong word to use, uh, as to what makes them um, so bold uh, or emboldened to carry on with the sexual assaults and rape. And when you can see that it happens every few minutes. So uh, there has to be, a, a, uh, there has to be uh, some more uh, strict actions uh, and I as we can discuss today on how a law like uh, sexual assault at workplace also may not be enough to you know, make the society peaceful and safe for the women. Now uh, in this talk I'll be trying to bring in very many issues uh, though it will be just touching upon few issues and this is a topic I think which needs a lot of deliberations and uh, 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 kind of loud thinking and also coming up very many uh, practical ways to make uh, the cities safe and not just cities in fact if you look at crime it happens in urban and also rural areas and the crimes in rural areas of a different kind and I'll be touching upon that 
So uh, there are many cases. In fact, there's another case which you have heard about Mumbai, where the guard actually uh, kept uh, tracking uh, a girl who stays in the same flats and he was the one who raped and murdered a journalist. So the point is whether uh, the lonely men in the cities uh, uh, after migration, because there's no release of their sexual urges, see women alone and uh, pray, uh, is this uh, a trend? I'm not really sure. And I think we need a little more uh, research on that. And there can be many reasons like jo uh, very long judicial procedures. And uh, when, when a man commits a crime for the first time, if he is sent back home uh, free without much punishment, then he gets emboldened and, may, and encouraged to make uh, or uh, commit more and bigger crimes. Uh, there can be also nexus between the criminals and the police. There are issues related to bribery or even the powerful who can get away uh, from the crime by putting pressures not to file a case or uh, diffuse a case or situation and not allowing uh, registry of the case, especially if the, if the, uh, the victim is from the lower socioeconomic background or marginalized sections. So all these lead to increase in crime and that's what we've been seeing for a long time. Now, who are the most vulnerable women? Definitely, as you can see, women are not a homogeneous entity. They are very heterogeneous and coming from different caste and class background and also occupational background. We can see that women mostly who are also vulnerable are also the ones who are in the contractual jobs one who are in the uh, unorganized sector, having temporary or corporate jobs at the mercy of sometimes bosses. And uh, in fact, after this law, which came uh, uh, sexual harassment at prevention of sexual harassment at workplace, that it boomeranged and many companies were not uh, hiring women anymore or were afraid to hire women because they thought if they hire women, then possibly it may go against, you know, uh, it's like an invited trouble. Why to invite trouble rather than uh, not hire women in their own companies? So though uh, ICC became an internal complainant committee and became mandatory, but there are still many, many organizations which are and companies which have not constituted ICC. Uh, there's also lack of awareness about the uh, uh, laws which are meant for the safety of women. Uh, many women, even educated, may not know the uh, uh, grievance mechanism, where to file a complaint, how to file a complaint. And very recent, our experience of uh, gender uh, uh, sensitization training and a seminar in one of the colleges, uh, nursing colleges in the city, where one of the teacher felt that her, her, she has been going through a lot of sexual harassment for a long time and she did not know how to uh, you know, uh, take steps to prevent it. And uh, uh, fortunately, uh, the chairperson of the National Commission for Women was there and she just told her that it's very simple and you have to just go online and register your complaint. And that's exactly what she did and within 15 minutes, she could register her complaint. So even uh, educated women may not be aware of uh, the mechanisms through which one can file their complaints. And there are also very few support systems. So if you look at women who, who are uh, assaulted within the home or who are living in the, uh, uh, you know, with, living with domestic violence, want to walk out of the house, are there enough hostels for working women? Are they well equipped? Are they well functioned? Uh, uh, women uh, know about these uh, homes and uh, during a pandemic, uh, during COVID last year, all these working women's hostel was closed. And we have seen that how uh, the cases of domestic violence and sexual assaults went up uh, multiple times. And that was the time when these uh, houses were required where women can just walk out and uh, take shelter. But unfortunately, these were closed. So these are some of the lessons we have learned through this pandemic and which we need to work on and make sure that whether pandemic or no pandemic, there should be support systems for women who are in distress to, to take uh, shelter. So, uh, however, uh, 
the uh, gendered understanding is coming up and gender sensitization we are all the time talking about and there are many uh, uh, institutions and organizations who are doing gender sensitization training and even the uh, police uh, personnel and the frontline workers are given these uh, gender sensitive trainings but what is important is whether that is absorbed whether that is practiced in everyday life this is something which we need to uh, think about seriously so when you look at gender relations and uh, in an, especially in patriarchal societies we need to really understand uh, the ways in which culture and society defines rights responsibilities and identities of men and women in relation to one another and uh, that's where we need to understand the concepts of patriarchy and power relations in a greater detail uh, as to everyday life how men women work together or how uh, a male and female uh, uh, interact or behave and uh, also because marriage is so universal in the country or uh, in many other countries marriage uh, is seen as a bond as a contract where uh, the relationship between male and female between husband and wife are many a times uh, uh, understood from different perspectives so if you look at uh, from a functional perspective if you look at from sociological uh, theories uh, marriage is the basic uh, 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 family is the basic unit and marriage actually binds the family and within a family Uh, the gender roles and roles are clearly defined and uh, the family then becomes a unit to make the society in an equilibrium state and there is always an equilibrium and there is always a sharing and the family plays a very important role of say uh, uh, gratification of sex and also for reproduction raising children and uh, it's also economic unit so whereby you see a family as a basic unit but when you look at the same thing from a conflict perspective a critical perspective conflict perspective not all families have this harmonious relationships and there are families where there are conflict within the husband wife or bit within the parents and children and then there is a constant negotiation where they are trying to keep up with the family intact however there are many uh, one can see that there is an increase in rise in uh, the divorce rates the separations and the fa- families falling apart so is it because uh, the society is changing and as you all know societies and cultures are never static they are all dynamic and there's always a change which happens and then when you look at the gender roles uh, initially uh, uh, maybe a decade back or two decades back a generation before uh there was a clear you no know, dependency or between a man and a woman and they had a clear defined roles men are taking care of you know, earning and women mostly are taking care of children and there was an interdependency between the two however women played very important role and anthropological literature do talk about women contributing to the sustenance of family where they 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 were the in, in the very very old and simple uh, societies of hunters and gatherers men used to hunt once in a while but women were the gatherers and they were sustaining the family and also rearing children and men were the hunters and also protectors because of their living in the forest but at the same time when you have when you see the changes in the society most industrialized societies and the contemporary societies you see women are working uh, at par with men working in the sense quote and quote working for wages or in income or uh, monetary terms because the word working women is again very contested and when you see working women are all the time working whether they are working at home as homemakers or whether they are working in the agriculture in their own fields which are all these works are invisible and many women who are uh, working but their work is not valued They, since they are not paid for it and that's where their work gets undervalued or uh, not valued and they don't get enough you know, respect and dignity of what they are doing in everyday life whereas women who are working and bring in cash at home have different things to face and there comes the 
the the conflict or a kind of uh, you know uh, disturbances within the family if there is a no proper understanding between husband wife if there is no sharing of work both inside and outside because both are working and till date uh, many women do double the work because they go out work and then come back and do all the household chores and there are very few men who take care and uh, share the house whole work equally with their women who are working outside so these changes in the societies if you see where women are also working outside and contributing to the family income in that case if there is no adjustment between the two then there is there is a no more fallout of the family and that's why where you can see the increasing uh, the increasing divorce or separations happening probably things may change after a while because uh, how we raise our boys how we socialize our children especially boys because uh, till a generation back they haven't seen their mothers going out and working so they expect that everything will be taken care by the mothers and later on by the wives but possibly the younger generation whose parents are both are working possibly see the kind of work burden which even women faces when they go out and work and also is expected to work at home may be more sensitive and they need to be socialized to see that there are roles which are changing and they have to work together so i i uh, deviated a bit on this topic but then this was important to know because uh, uh, how the gender relationships work and how if there is no uh, harmony within the gender relationship then there becomes a much more a conflict happening there and uh, that can lead to domestic violence that can lead to assaults of many uh, uh, kinds and even though we have a law for domestic violence uh, uh, you know uh, prevention of domestic violence but even then we see that so much uh, of domestic violence keep happening and most of the time the perpetrators are known to the women mostly by husband or even sometimes father over their daughters so uh, how do we see this uh, sociologically and anthropologically we need to really understand social relationships changing societies changing cultures how do we adjust and adapt at the same time how the law can function well despite having very strong laws why is it that the crime still continue to uh, uh, increase and uh, uh, even though uh, we have a lot of scholars or feminists there are feminist movements which are happening and then even then if the crime is not controlled we need to really understand where thread as to what are the triggers with all the factors which uh, are which perpetuate you know uh, gender uh, uh, violence and we also need to you know we keep talking of patriarchy we keep talking of power relations how do we understand them again more a nuanced way and how do we bring in change um, in fact i was also part of one of the whatsapp groups where there were a lot of lawyers activists working on uh, juvenile justice and working on child abuse but uh, whenever there were uh, incidents of uh, rape happening among the young children as young as few months old even the activists and the lawyers felt very uh, helpless and in that whatsapp group they felt that what can we do if, uh, if things are getting so worse then uh, i too felt that uh, despite us being educated empowered what so called empowered we feel but then when it comes to such grave crime Uh, we are not able to do much so uh, that's where i think we need to really look into aspects of you know uh, power relations and beyond that when you look at power relations who are the perpetrators what kind of crime they are doing uh, uh, and uh, what kind of uh, protection they have from the law because they come from the powerful families uh, and how who are the ones who are being sexually assaulted Uh, and if you look at the uh, the crime rates especially in delhi uh, delhi has the highest missing children and when we worked with the uh, communities in the uh, bastis most of the women uh, said that they are afraid that their children will be kidnapped and they despite coming from poor families were not working and they said we have to go and drop the child child to the school and bring them back because we are afraid that the child will be kidnapped 
and even children express that that between the age group of 3 to 13 years children can be kidnapped and why is this kidnap so rampant in mostly the mostly the uh, slums why not in the middle and upper middle classes so clearly the class dimension comes in clearly the power relations comes in clearly people who are from the lower socio economic background if their children are being kidnapped they are not heard and that's where the role of the police and the and the um, the legal systems comes into picture as to how much they make them accountable and how much they are you know, uh, empathetic towards the communities and towards towards the marginalized communities within the cities so uh, and as you know and um, trafficking is on rise and then this is you know children becomes very uh, a kind of commodities to be trafficked for uh, maybe for domestic work for maybe for the labor maybe for beggary or baby even for sex work so uh, these are the social issues which we face every day but then we need to really understand how uh, these power relations work in everyday life and how that can be taken care now when we want to understand elements of gender analysis because these when we say gendered relations we need to understand gendered analysis that includes women men girls and boys in terms of their division of labor their roles and responsibilities and their access to and control over resources and their relative conditions and position in society as i just explained as to how all these play an important role who are the most vulnerable and who are not so vulnerable and that's where that's where we need to focus on the the communities which are more vulnerable which are more at risk and uh, who needs more some support and empathy but it's always the other way around that those who are poor and uh, those who are poor and marginalized uh, do not get that kind of support system and uh, in fact uh, uh, nancy skipper hughes and cohen uh, understanding of uh, say uh, uh, structural violence uh, is very important to understand in the context of india also where who are the ones who are who are because of their position in the social structure they face violence every day in every form whether it's a direct violence uh, maybe sexual violence but apart from that any other aspects of hunger or you no know, lack of uh, resources uh, water sanitation or even healthcare these are all uh, the violence which they faced as being a part of the social structures in the lowest social uh, ladder so uh, one needs to understand this division of labor how resources are allocated what are the power relations to see and these gender based inequities in in a given society and it's very interesting to see wherever the societies have gender equality better uh, uh, gender equality there is less crime against women the more the gender inequities the more is the crime now gender issues include all aspects and concerns related to women and men's life and situation in a society to the way that they interrelate their differences in access to and use of resources their activities and how they react to changes interventions and policies so when we address these gender relations we need to understand from the uh, perspective of having the resources which uh, who avails what kind of resources and that's where when you look at women not having any support system and not having uh, say uh, immobile property are the most uh, you know uh, uh, in in terms of vulnerable because they they don't have any access to the resources and that's where the the uh, uh, now the law is saying that both girl and a boy that's daughter and uh, son should be equal partners and equal share of their immobile property is a very good step to, towards making women more strong and also making women uh, uh, protected from any kind of violence now when you look at uh, sexual violence it's basically for the first time now people are talking about it generally it was not talked about and not spoken and there was a culture of silence and uh, there was also a paucity of research in the field of sexual violence now even rape uh, seems to be constituted as a legitimate object of research 
and researching rape is embedded in contesting historical, social, and political processes, as told by Herman, uh, an author, who now looks at rape as a very much embedded in the historical, social, and political processes. That's where we need to really understand. However, a uh, UN declaration on the elimination of violence against women, they came up with the uh, expression that violence against women is a manifestation of historically unequal power relations between men and women. And that violence against women is one of the crucial social mechanisms by which women are forced into subordinate position compared with men. So this type of violence is gender-based and that's why meaning the acts of violence are committed against women. And that's where one has to work on uh, protection of women and see that uh, there is more of gender equality rather than having uh, one as uh, subordinate and over the other. Now, studies have shown that higher rates of sexual violence are expected to be more prevalent in cultures that encourage objectification of women. Now, uh, and thus making them appear inferior to men. Now, when you say objectification, we know we have seen in many of our advertisements, media, films, all the time showcasing women as objects and the songs, especially uh, talking about women as objects. And in many countries, uh, not all cases are reported as high as you know, uh, higher percentage of sexual violence. Many, many, in many countries, sexual violence go unreported and uh, because of the sensitivity of the issue and more so uh, making it difficult to gather exact figures and true sense of the problem. Even the NCRB data which, is, uh, which comes out uh, is, not, uh, is uh, kind of under-reporting. If you look at incest, hardly any incest reportings come out and the NCRB data also gives very minimal uh, however, when you look at uh, one of the studies in 2017 by Ministry of Women and Child Development, shows that every third girl and every fifth boy have faced violence, uh, sexual abuse as children, and that's quite rampant. So the point is there is hardly any data, and people do not report because this is a very sensitive issue, and and it is uh, in in. The unreported uh, sexual offenses are higher in the Asian cultures because virginity is highly valued and uh, women's modesty is at most importance, which is given to the family and which requires respect. So the family honor lies on the women's uh, honor and any kind of sexual assault or rape on a woman is seen as uh, an assault on the family and thereby many cases of whether incest or whether sexual assault or rape go underreported. Now, when you look at uh, how uh, even the script of rape, which is like how uh, the rape is seen as and how it is justified, is very uh, interesting to see the power relationships. And for any sexual assault or rape, generally it is said, we, we did that because we wanted to teach a lesson. It was, uh, it's a very dominant way of explaining and a justificatory narrative. And uh, there are scholars like Moffat, Rao, and uh, Pratiksha Bakshi who have written on this about how the script in the courtrooms talk about uh, rape and how they are justified by saying that uh, it's a woman who provoked them or it, it, it is because they have done something and they have to be taught a lesson. And these kind of narratives also are seen in other countries like Africa, where Moffat talks about uh, in post-apartheid democratic South Africa, these justificatory narrative structures where male narratives of rape as a technique of punishing women for expressing their will and wish was seen as a, a, a teaching lesson. And uh, also raises striking possibilities of comparative research. When you do a comparative research, which in many anthropological uh, research, we try and see how it is there in other cultures. And that's where when you look at in the Indian context also, the dominant caste script of uh, sexual domination are 
populated with humiliating language of teaching a lesson uh, to the Dalits and a uh, study by Rao shows that how when you look at uh, the uh, rapes across the country and many uh, rape of Dalit women is much more common. And however, it's not, uh, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't come out, many are, goes unreported. And, uh, and that, that's where the caste dynamics work, where the upper caste may feel that it is one way of teaching lesson to the Dalits. And uh, there are other numerous ways uh, where uh, sexual assaults have been seen, like a jilted lover uh, teaching a lesson to a girl because she denies her ad uh, his advances. And there are numerous rapes which have happened across the rural belt on Dalit women, as I said, go unreported or no FIRs are written, no cases are filed because again, the, uh, coming from the bottom rung of the society, uh, Dalit women may not be in a position to um, file a case or even if they file a case, which we have seen in the recent uh, cases where then they are uh, targeted, their family members are killed. So it becomes very complicated and complex and all these uh, uh, play out uh, in the caste system. And uh, uh, you, you might have read in the newspapers also, even in the UP borders, even if a family is going, a husband, wife and a child in a, in a cycle, uh, men can just stop the women and then uh, gang rape women, uh, beat up the man and uh, you know, leave them uh, after all this. So that shows uh, how they are emboldened uh, because they have not been punished in the beginning when they started with the crime and they live with impunity. So these are some of the cases which we can think about. However, in 2012, as all of you know, Nirbhaya made a, a news and it was unprecedented to see the kind of protests and activism which came in, which was largely because it was a case which was so gory and uh, which was uh, not acceptable at any level. But it was also because it was an urban case, a case with a middle class girl, an educated family and happened in the open daylight. And that's where it was a threat to for every girl and every woman in the city that you could see such you know, backlash and such uh, protests, not backlash, such protests and activism which came in uh, post Nirbhaya. But when you uh, uh, look at in the, in the rural belt, uh, many of these cases just go as one another case not even talked about. Even uh, a, a point where the CM of Delhi made a comment saying that I fear for my daughter, uh, uh, showing that how even the most powerful woman in the city can feel the fear or feel ang anxious about her own daughter. Then what, what about the common women and how about the fears of a common uh, woman or a mother whose young daughter goes out uh, in the city? So these are some of the very uh, serious issues which needs a lot of deliberation. And I'm sure it's not just the law which can take care. It has to be a sensitization and empathy coming at every level. There are also courtroom vocabularies as I was talking about the narratives which come in and uh, uh, the, the vocabulary, the motives which the people who commit uh, crime, they never say that it is violent. They never say that it is a crime then they basically, they will say uh, that uh, you know, because of certain gestures or certain dress, which they, they think that they were invited, or they even if the woman is saying no, they think that it is yes. So which means they, there are very many cultural assumptions which populate rape trials. And when you look at how the courtroom uh, discussions goes on, so uh, even during cross-examination, uh, defense lawyers sometimes dominate linguistic space by using repetitive uh, as a strategy, whereby repetition of a description of a sexual act, the position, the scenes amount to judicial pornography, and this written by Das and Taslitz, traumatizing and humiliating the raped. So it's like, again, uh, raping the person and trying to bring out the trauma. And this you have seen in the film Damini very clearly, and also the films like recent films like Pink and uh, the assaults which women face and the stalking which happens uh, are also seen in some of the films where stalking is seen as a way to convince a girl that they love. 
and a film like Ranjana, which was also shown that how ultimately a girl will say yes. So as long as she is saying no, it is just a process of making her to say yes. And that's why even the stalking becomes a part of the uh, process of uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to get into a relationship. So these needs to be understood from a cultural point of view. Then there are unequal powers and cultural factors. Both are real and perceived and they are influenced by cultural factors and values. Now, um, when you look at, there are two ways to look at. One is sociocentric, the other is egocentric cultures. When you look at uh, the roles and representations of genders and attitudes towards sexual violence, it differs because when you look at cultures which are described as feminist, provide equal power to both men and women. However, feminist is not seen in the right light in the most, uh, mostly in the common uh, everyday life. And feminists are again seen from a negative connotation as very emboldened, very bold and very uh, you know, open and liberal and many other ways in which the common society thinks about and they fear feminists rather. And uh, when you look at sexual violence is likely to occur more commonly in culture that fosters beliefs of perceived male superiority and social and cultural inferiority of women. So thereby culture is an important factor to understand sexual violence in its entirety. And we need to look at as well as beyond cultural structures, their strengths and weaknesses. So when you say socio-centric cultures, where uh, it is the social relationships and it is subsumed in the family or the kinship, the honor is with the family and kinship. And comparatively to egocentric cultures, where it is the self which is at the core, with independence and being given more importance than interdependence on the family. And thereby in socio-centric cultures, many of these sexual assaults are pushed under the carpet and not spoken about because then it will bring a bad name to the family compared to egocentric cultures where individual is uh, the person and it, it all depends on the individual to take up the case and fight for the justice. Now, um, I wanted to briefly talk about, uh, if I have 10 more minutes time, uh, the ways in which uh, we could uh, look into the biological or evolutionary theory of sexual violence. It emphasizes the evolution applies to sexual violence as a result of man's natural sexual urge, which is different from that of a woman. And it is controversial and it's not acceptable anymore. So earlier when uh, the theories were talking about uh, the uh, sexual assaults as psychopathological problem. So in the research in 1940s and 50s, uh, talked about uh, rape done by people, done by men who are psychopathological. And uh, Pratiksha Bakshi in her writing in one of the articles in Annual Review of Anthropology, talks about these different perspectives to look at and how psychopathological model of rape constructed rapists was seen as abnormal, suggesting that compared with other criminals, rapists experience greater castration anxiety, that because they fear the loss of masculinity or they have this phallic inadequacy that they don't feel comfortable in their own sexuality, that they re relieve their stress by uh, uh, sexual assault or by raping women. And this kind of understanding was there, but Brown Miller in 75 and his influential work came up with the understanding that rape is a preferred form of political violence against women. And it is not an expression of overpowering or pathological male lust. So when you talk of sexual violence, it's not really the lust, which is important to understand. It is, it may be not be the male lust, but it, it is much more political. It much, it is much more to show the, uh, the dominance uh, through their power. And uh, rape is a normal mode of exerting patriarchal power. So it's not anything abnormal, but it is a normal mode of exerting patriarchal power as intentional and premediated political violence. So if it's uh, violence against Dalits or rapes against Dalit women, it's much more a political violence rather than uh, one, uh, or, uh, one or two cases, which is uh, not the case. 
Now, when you look at feminists argue that rape is not isolated or aberrant or pathological, and it is a myth that strangers will rape. Very rarely strangers rape, but it's mostly survivors. Uh, when you talk to them, it is the uh, rape. Rapists are mostly acquaintance for the, uh, the survivors and the known person who are mostly the rapists. And uh, one can also look into uh, the ways in which these uh, assaults happen. Uh, statistics, however, have compiled to indicate that high rates of rapes are related to greater sexual inequality. So in the, some, in the societies where there is greater sexual inequality, there are more cases of sexual assaults and rape compared to lesser social inequalities. Now, um, rape prone cultures are characterized by male domination and high rates of interpersonal violence and masculinities which express and experience selfhood through violence. And uh, they, they express violence through these activities of uh, assaults and rape. And uh, I would like to end by uh, giving some examples like a study by Margaret Mead uh, growing up in Samoa Islands. Uh, she compared the adolescents and the youth of American culture and Samoan culture and found that American uh, adolescents are much more anxious when they grow up into adults uh, compared to Samo Samoa uh, uh, youngsters and the youth who are, uh, whose, cul who, whose culture is in such a way that there is an easy transition from childhood to adolescence to adulthood. And similarly, if you look at the tribes in India, the, 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 the uh, communities like Gond or Muria tribes in Chhattisgarh, they have these practices of Gotul, uh, the institution called Gotul, where young boys and girls can date, select their partners and marry and have sex or have sex without marriage. And uh, unfortunately for outsiders, these are seen in a negative way. And uh, we have seen that more and more the tribes have an egalitarian and gender equality. And that's where there are lesser sexual assaults on tribal women by the tribal men not the other way around that many a times tribal women are assaulted by outsiders rather than tribal men. So what are the ways forward? How do we work towards it? One, one of the ways in which uh, we need to understand is working with the boys. And this has been done in some other countries. Um, looking at the uh, programs to reach out to men and boys uh, where there are a few examples uh, where uh, like uh, there is a global alliance called Men Engage and they address sexual exploitation specifically and also address questions of masculinities and gender equality. There are other organizations like ProMundo and, and Gender Health, the International Planned Parenthood Federation, Family Violence Prevention Fund, International Center for Research for Women, ICRW, WHO, UNFPA, UNIFEM, UNDP, uh, then uh, Gender Justice Project, Save the Children, Men for Gender Equality, and Men's Resource International, Sayog, and White Ribbon Campaign. So there are many campaigns and there are many global alliances which are coming together to engage with men and also make uh, men understand uh, all these you know, socially constructed ways of looking at masculine and feminine, and which is not the uh, right way to understand the gender relationships. And we also need research on intersectionalities across caste, class, gender, ethnicity, religion, to see the data on women who are assaulted and raped. Because uh, unless we see these intersectionalities, we cannot really uh, identify those who are at the uh, at risk and most vulnerable. We need to also expedite the judicial processes to punish the perpetrators, expose those who are sexual predators, but then there is this registry for sexual offenders, which is again debatable because uh, we are not sure whether this is going to be really useful or it can uh, harm uh, more. Because if, uh, if an innocent man is name is put in the sexual offenders, his life is over. Um, and especially given countries where there is so much of like, corruption or, uh, or even sometimes power relations, 
where innocent people can be trapped and real uh, criminals can be you know uh, free uh, can can free themselves from any such you know crimes so these are something which we need to think about when there is this registry of sexual offenders which which uh, has been introduced i suppose then research and understand the psyche of sexual offenders uh, i'm not sure how much research has been done um uh, in india on the psyche of sexual offenders and uh, this i personally have been uh, uh, following up with the bpr and the, uh, the police uh, research bureau to take up few studies to understand why uh, uh, they commit sexual crimes and especially for children because my concern is also related to children and why is it because often they say that women because they are dressed uh, skimpily or um they are the ones who are seducing or attracting that they can rape can happen which is absolutely nonsense but at the same time rape happens to young children who can't even speak so what is the psyche of these men who does such you know, uh, serious crimes so unless we know that it's very difficult to stop such a crime so even though there may be a law law will help only once the crime is done even though we have this prevention of law sexual harassment at work place there is a deterrent it is a deterrent now with setting up of ics um, but then it can go against as i said many companies are not hiring women and then there are uh, uh, many institutions where there are no ics so one important thing is to understand the root cause and that may be research to understand the psyche of the men who commit these crimes having a good database and for that people have to come forward and report again that will happen only when the judiciary and when the police system is open and uh, is full proof is uh, uh, free and fair to the people and especially the poor to come and register their cases and support systems to fight uh, these cases at every level and so the law enforcement agencies need to be sensitive and empathize with the poor and the marginalized people in power does not affect them because when you see who are being raped who are being kidnapped mostly the poor in that case uh, people who are in the power whether bureaucrats or police personnel or all of us who are say middle upper middle and uh, better of families uh, if these things do not happen to us we are least bothered so that kind of apathy is going on and that's where i think it's very important that each each one of us have to be empathetic to the people who are especially from the lower ranks and uh, marginalized because they have hardly any say and in the power game they are at the most bottom and are not heard and even though uh, assaults are happening on them on everyday basis and strong media and judiciary can stop violence against women and only if they are sensitive to women issues and issues related to sexual abuse thank you so much i'll stop here and i'm i'll be very glad to take up any questions thank you so much ma'am uh, so if any of the participants have any of the questions this is the time uh, you can put it down in the chat box you can put it up in the q and a box so uh, please let us know we'll be taking uh, questions for two or three more minutes so please let us know feel free to ask any queries or it i'll be happy to share uh, happy to listen to your comments and also any experiences you have gone through and your views on this topic but it's very difficult to interact on online mode but uh, i'll be very happy to hear from you yes you can just raise your hand and i'll i'll allow you to talk on zoom so you can just do that if anyone wants to say something okay there is one question by rajiv mishra saying that ma'am uh hame uh mandatory banana chahiye school tuition mein uh, good touch and bad touch or boys ko respect karna uh, shayad sudhar jaye aur ladki ko right ka uh, bare mein kya kar sakti hai 
अच्छा आई जस्ट वॉन्टेड टू से दैट दिस गुड टच एंड बैड टच इंफॉर्मेशन एंड अवेयरनेस हैज बीन बिल्ड बाई टू लीड एन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन इन साउथ एंड दे हैव चेंज द नेम फ्रॉम गुड एंड बैड टच टू सेफ एंड अनसेफ टच now good touch bad touch for a child it is very difficult to see the intention of the person who is assaulting the child a child may not be able to see the bad intentions may just go with the uh, feelings so which which a child cannot decipher whether it's a good or bad but if to uh, now these uh, illustration to say that nobody should be touching the private parts of a girl or a boy Uh, and that will be unsafe touch rather than good or bad touch so these campaigns are going on but then the point is uh, my other work on uh, child abuse uh, poxo is very stringent law but how many people will uh, come up and report uh, under poxo because when 80% of uh, the child abuse is happening within the home and by the people known to them so many of the times these things don't come out and uh, even though we have very strong law like poxo it is very important for us to uh, uh, generate awareness make people aware about such assaults and children have to be protected so you are right that school should have a complaint register school staff and principal and others should be sensitive to children and we have been advocating uh, that uh, uh, the school curriculum should have uh, you know lessons from class 1 to 12 depending on the comprehension of the child about child rights how many people know about children and child rights how many people know what is a child line number many parents even don't know or teachers don't know and also there is a school health program where children are uh, children undergo a physical checkup every year so there should be a module on sexual health teachers should be trained to see if if a child is being abused because these can be seen uh, through certain uh, some ways where the child suddenly go quiet or you can see some marks on the child or there the change in behavior so a teacher can identify and the doctor can look into it and the parents can be uh, you know uh, made aware of it and definitely uh, when you say that uh, the transport system we have seen many children being uh, you know assaulted in the transport so uh, in delhi of course the transports the teacher has to accompany in the bus till the last child get down so there are certain mechanisms which are being built in so that the children are safe and uh, so there not just one step there are many steps to be taken and as i said poxo is a strong law but how many people know about poxo right so i think this is what is we, uh, what we need to do there lot lot of things to be done if we want to make our children and women safe right right so as you said not a lot of people know about poxo a lot of people also do not know about uh, posh which is also a challenge how to implement those because employers try to you know they just want to evade the law because they feel there is a lot of compliance yes. true so yeah any i don't see any questions any further questions as of now so right i think it was a very insightful session i personally had uh, got to learn a lot i am sure it was so for all the participants uh, i think we can conclude the session now if you say ma'am okay thank you thank you so much ma'am for taking out your time and being with us okay